And uh, turn over to the book of Job. Job chapter number one. And we're going to look at just these first five verses in Job chapter number one. For our message this morning, of course, today is Father's Day. And we have fathers in mind as we get into our message for today. And so we're going to read just these first few verses out of Job chapter number one. And I'm going to bring a message to you that will be really a challenge to the dads and the fathers that are in the room, um, as well as a challenge to the rest of us, as we could consider all these points that I will share with you today, a definite challenge to all of us. So let's all stand together as we read, if you are able, we'll stand out of respect of God's word. And we're going to read through this account here, um, a, a testimony of a, a man whose life was right before the Lord. And so we're going to look at Job chapter number 1. Follow along as I read beginning in verse number 1. Job 1, 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. What a wonderful testimony for a man. You know, not only is this a testimony recorded in scriptures, Okay, so we know it's a true testimony. But God himself says this about Job in verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there be none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And so we see recorded in scriptures that God actually said this, verbally said this about Job. What a wonderful testimony for a man to have. Verse number 2, And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of, e of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one on his day, or every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, verse number 5, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, as you look at that last little phrase, that really is the key to what made him a great man. Thus did Job continually. Not something he did once, not something we thought of and wished he would do that, so he decided to try it and did it a couple times and was done. This was the way of life for Job. This is what he did. And uh, he was definitely a great man. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight, this morning, I'm sorry, on the subject of priorities of a good father. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have given to us. And Lord, there's just so much, so many ways that we have been blessed. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help every one of us to be thankful and to remember, Lord, how good you have been and how good you are. Lord, thank you for the fathers that we have, and I pray that this message will be a challenge to them as well as to the rest of us to, to do right and to prioritize and to keep things um, properly in perspective. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would Help us to love you and to grow closer to you, Lord, and to be right before you and others. And, and Lord, be with this simple message. May it be used, Lord, in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Life will demand a lot of our time. There are things that make up our lives that require us to be places and to do things and to take care of responsibilities. And and oftentimes these things come up and they, they demand our time. And we, ended up, we end up becoming very busy with our lives because of all the demands that we have. Um, there are responsibilities that we have that we need to take care of. And they're all legitimate things that we need to make sure we're handling and, and doing a good job at those things. Um, you have a job and you should be faithful to your job. And you should put an honest day's work in when that when that opportunity arises and work hard at your job and, and, and you know, provide for your responsibilities and you were hired to do a job and you go there and you do that job and you don't slough off or you don't allow yourself to be 
distracted by other things, but you focus on the work that you have in front of you because that's what you're paid to do, and that's, it's a good thing. It's a priority that we have. On top of that, you have your own responsibilities outside of your work. And, and we say work because many people spend many hours at their job. 40, 50, 60 hours a week will be dedicated towards being at your job or your workplace. And that's a place where you know, you're going to be spending a lot of your time. And that's something you should be faithful to. Um, as a good father, for sure. But any, any one of us that has a job, we should do our best at it. But even outside of our work that we have, we have other responsibilities that we need to keep in mind as well. We have families and we're fathers and mothers and, and we you know, have parents and we have families that we want to do right by and want to have those relationships in our lives that we want to make sure that we're doing right in those relationships and making sure we're the right kind of mom or dad or or right kind of a husband or wife or brother or sister. And, and all the relationships, we keep those things in perspective and we say to ourselves, I need to do right in those areas. And then there's opportunities beyond that to serve. Your, your church, we have opportunities at the church to serve and do something for the Lord. Things are going to last for eternity. And, and, uh, and we have those responsibilities and those things come into our lives and we become very busy with those things as the pastor gets up and has these crazy plans and ideas for all of you and you say to yourself, what is he thinking? <laughs> we have those responsibilities and then uh, on top of that we have those things that just come up. You know, we get these phone calls out of nowhere that someone's coming in town to visiting or uh, something happened that we need to be part of or could you help out with this or you know, need help moving, could you give me a hand this weekend coming up, or whatever it is, all these things, and, and, and with time, and, and as life goes on, and we all know this to be true, as, as time goes on, our lives seem to become more and more busy. Uh, so many things that demand our time, and so many things that we have to get to, and so many things that we need to get done, and we can remember Years ago when we were children and one day seemed to last forever and there was so much going on in a day and so much you had time, you had stuff to do before lunch and then lunch was a big deal and then between lunch and dinner you had all this time to take care of things and do things as a child. And, but as you get older you realize and you, you take on responsibilities and our time becomes so short. And before you know it you're finding yourself at the beginning of summer saying to yourself, man summer's going to go by fast. With all that's on the calendar and all that's ahead of us. And all I have to do before you know it, summer's going to be gone. Uh, and, and sometimes we even discourage ourselves thinking that way. Thinking to yourself, boy, time just goes by so quick. But it just seems to be so true. Our lives get so busy and time goes by so fast. And we have so much in our lives that, that you know, take up our time. Time becomes a very, you know, a very precious commodity. As we say to ourselves, boy, I don't have a lot of it. So much I want to get done. I seem to stay up late and get up early, and I still can't get to all of it. Uh, and time becomes a, such this valuable commodity because you, you want to not waste the time that you have, and, and you want to make sure that you do the best with what is in front of you. All that being said, because we have time and, and our time becomes short, we must do that which is most important first. We have to prioritize. We have to say, wait a minute, what is most important? And I have to make time for that. You know, in our um, adult Sunday school class, we're in Joshua 24. We just went over Joshua 23 last, last week. And uh, today we're in Joshua 24. And, and Joshua, who led the children of Israel into the promised land, um, is at the end of his life. And the Bible says that he is old and, and stricken in years. He's, he's, he's an old man now. And his perspective... On, on life at this point is a perspective of a man who has lived his life, who's had his experiences and, and God has used in many ways. And now he's looking back at his life, okay, from his perspective and giving some final instructions and some final words to the nation of Israel before he will die. And he will die at the end of chapter 24. And it's interesting to think about that as you think about someone who has lived their life and now they're looking back and they realize their time is very short here on this earth and they don't have a lot of time left and they're going to begin talking about those things that are most important, at least in their minds, because that's what they're going to look back and they're going to give some kind of advice or counsel to someone younger or someone that's going to follow after them. They're going to make sure to talk about the most important things that they could think of. And of course, Joshua 
points them towards the Lord Jesus, well, Jehovah God, and, and serving God and serving Christ, you know. Um, and, and we in our own lives have a tendency to take those things that are most important, those things really that, that are most important in our lives, we have a tendency to sometimes brush those things aside because oftentimes those things aren't demanding our time. Those are the things that aren't, you know, insisting that we get to it because if we don't get to it, we're going to not be able to accomplish it. Those kind of things that are most important oftentimes aren't screaming for our attention and we sometimes neglect those important things. So we need to prioritize purposely to do those things that are most important. Um, spending time with the Lord is the most important thing you'll do. Uh, hey, the most important decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as your Savior. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins. How many people in this world have never done that, never taken time for that? They don't see the importance of it. Uh, but as a believer, spending time with the Lord, growing in the Lord, knowing the Lord better, making time to read His Word and praying to Him and spending time with Him, praying for your family, praying for your children. This example we see of Job and and, and praying for his family and his children, all right? Now, those things are important in our lives, and we have to say to ourselves, these are the most important things, and these are the things I have to make time to focus on because all the other things will fall into place if I seek first the kingdom of God, seek him first, then all these things shall be added unto you, right? Everything's going to fall into place like it should if we keep God first in our lives. And we have to prioritize and keep those things first, okay? So we must do that which is most important first. Our time is very valuable and so many things demand our time. As we get older, we realize how important it is that we do right with the time that we have. Uh, so we have to prioritize and put those things that are most important first. Now, as we look at Job in, in Job chapter number 1, he was described in the scripture as being several things. The Bible says he was perfect and upright, we see in verse number 1. The idea of perfect is to be uh, mature, uh, someone who's growing in the Lord. Per perfect does not mean he was sinless. The Bible is very clear that all have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right? um, he was perfect and upright. He was honest with his dealings and the things that he did. Okay, he was honest with those things. The Bible says that he's one that feared God. And we see that in verse number one. He was perfect and upright, and he was one that feared God, okay, in his life. And um, the Bible also says in verse number one that he eschewed evil, all right? He, he made sure to uh, stay away from and avoid those things and purposely stepped away from those things that were wrong or evil. But then the Bible says something else about him that's very interesting, all right? The Bible says that he was perfect and upright. It says he's one that feared God, is one that he eschewed evil. But notice verse number two, and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He was also a father, he had all these characteristics described about him in verse number one, but then right away after that it points out that he was a dad. He had a responsibility of being a father or having a family that he had to watch out for. And so this morning I'd like to take just a moment as we see that Job was a man who knew what was important. Job was a man who knew how to prioritize those things and make time for those things that were most important in his life. Okay? I want to take a, a moment to um, look at how he prioritized things in his life. As a result of his proper prioritizing, we can see that he had proper relationships. And we can see that he had a family that he cared for and looked over. These first few verses that Job, uh, a man that, Job, a man that God recognized as being perfect and upright and, and feared God and eschewed evil. He was a father, he was a dad, and not only was he a father, but he was a good father who prioritized those important things that were in his life. Um, and as a result of prioritizing, we see several things here that Job was right, okay, before several different groups. And we're going to look at this this morning, the few points that I have. Job was right before others. Number one, Job was right before others. Notice if you would in verse number one, it says here, um, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright. Being perfect and upright, or in other words, being mature, right, and honest with his dealings, an upright man did right, okay, um, being that way was something that would be a reflection and noticed by other people. 
Job was right before others. He acted mature. He grew. The word perfect does not mean that he was sinless, without sin. It does mean that he had grown in his relationship with the Lord. You and I as believers can be, the Bible says, for us to be perfect as he is perfect. Uh, and you and I can grow in the Lord. Romans chapter number 8 tells us that we are conforming to be in the image of his son. Peter tells us, um, in, and I think it's Second Peter, that we need to grow in grace. And so we need to be growing in the Lord and, and getting closer to him. And we can be to the place where, we, where God can say about us. If God can say this about Job, God can say this about us because Job is born a man just like you and I. He's a sinner just like you and I are. But God actually said about him in a um, uh, uh, verse number 8, God actually said about him, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man. So here we have a man that is, in the, in the words of God, a man who's a sinner, but the Bible says that he's perfect. Psalm 37, 37, mark the perfect man. We've got to watch for uh, and note the man who is perfect. We can be, in this biblical definition of what perfect is, we can be perfect or we can be mature. We can grow. Now, that is different for everybody because we're all at different levels, right? We're all growing at different levels. Some people um, just recently came to know the Lord and they're just starting their walk out with God. And they're, they're excited about the things of the Lord. There's a, there's a zeal about them. There's an excitement about them because there's so much to learn and so much new. To, uh, and, and they're growing in the Lord. And some people growing by leaps and bounds because they just came to know the Lord recently. And they're, they're reading their Bibles and they're learning about him. And, and, uh, and although they may still have some struggles that they have, because we all have struggles. Uh, but there may be some difficulties they're dealing with because uh, they're, they're trying to get, overcome some things in their lives. They are growing close to the Lord, and some folks who just came to know the Lord are growing so much in God uh, that they have grown more in the last several months than some people who have been saved for many, many years. Brother Hiles used to say, you know, when he would preach, he would say that there may be, the most spiritual person in this room might be someone who smokes cigarettes because they have grown so much from where they were just a few months ago. Still dealing with things they need to deal with, but they are growing in the Lord. And some folks have been sitting in the pew for many, many, many years, and they aren't growing at all. They've gotten so comfortable with everything. They know where they sit. They know where the, uh, you know, they know what, what song we're probably going to sing that day. And if you told them a song, they could tell you what hymn number it was. And, and if you told them a hymn number, they'd tell you what song it was. And they could sing it without even looking at it. They've just been going to church so long. And they're familiar with how things work. And, and, uh, and if you someone were to come in and sit in their seat on a Sunday morning, they'd walk in and they'd say, what is that person doing in my seat? They're just used to how things work and how it rolls and what they do. Uh, uh, and they're no longer growing in the Lord. We're all at different levels. All of us should be continuing to grow. Even those believers that have been around for a long time and trusted Christ years ago, we all stood, st should still be growing closer to the Lord. There's a growing process. We all need to be maturing. As we mature, as we grow, others will see that. We should be honest with our dealings. We should be upright. We should be someone who can be trusted. All right, a, a dad, a father, a good father who has pr his priorities straight is, all right, perfect and upright. Right before others. Others can see they're growing. Others can, can trust in them and count on them to be a man of their word. If you're going to say something and you're going to mean it and you're going to carry through with it. And they don't have to wonder if you're going to do what you said because if you said you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Uh, someone who is upright. Job was right as a, as a father, as an individual. Job was, Job was right before others, perfect and upright, uh, mature, acted mature, lived growing uh, in the Lord and honest with his dealings. Number two, Job was right before others. Number two, Job was right before God. Notice what it says here in verse number one. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God. Job was right before the Lord. You know, that the fear of God is something that can be sometimes difficult for us to understand. And after all, just the phrase itself, why should we be fearful of God? Why should we be scared of God? Well, that doesn't even make sense, right? But the Bible talks oftentimes about fearing the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. We need to fear the Lord. And what it's talking about here, what, it, what it's speaking of, is a proper reverence towards God. A proper 
acknowledgement of how powerful and mighty God is and where we stand before him. And here we are sinners and here we are uh, undeserving of what God has for us, but yet God has turned his attention and paid attention to us as sinners and there ought to be a certain you know, reverence towards that that says, God, it's a wonderful thing that you uh, in your perfectness and in your mighty power would be interested in me. And we have a fear of him in that we understand how powerful he is and how great that he is. Um, uh, uh, a correct fear of God is demonstrated in, in this earth that we're in, right, in, the, in, the, in this life that we have. A correct fear of God is demonstrated in a relationship between the father and his children. So if we want to get an idea of what a proper fear of God is, you see a proper relationship between a father and their children. Um, children... Uh, look up to their father as the authority in their life, in their home. And children would want to make sure that they please their dad and want to uh, make sure that they, uh, you know, have a good relationship with dad. They want to obey, obey dad and they want to grow and, and, and have a relationship with their father. You know, it's important for children to have that. Um, and, and when they have that proper relationship with their dads, okay, they're learning how to have that proper relationship with the Lord. Um, as they're developing that right kind of relationship they have between mom and dad. This is what's detrimental about the, uh, a dad not being the right kind of a father. When a dad's not the right kind of father in their home, they're not teaching their children how to have that right attitude and the right spirit towards their heavenly father. And a wonderful example of the fear of the Lord is a child's proper fear of their dad. Okay, when I walk into the house... Um, and, and, I'm, and I walk in the door from being at work or in the office or whatever, um, my kids shouldn't be scared of me running to different rooms because dad just walked in the house. That's not the proper fear of dad. Uh, now, there are times in their lives when they should be scared of dad. <laughs> you know, when they are taking a cookie from the cookie jar and when they're not supposed to, you know, when I was young, we used to have this cookie jar that had, it was a, it was a shape of a pig, and the top of the jar was a pig's head. And when you picked the pig's head up to open the jar, it made an oinking noise. <coughs> this, this squeaking noise that a pig would make. So everybody knew if you were getting into the cookie jar, they, they were able to alleviate that problem. Although usually we're all in on having cookies anyways. It wasn't a problem. But um, uh, they're doing something they're not supposed to do. A healthy fear of dad says, you know, I, I, I don't want dad to catch me doing this because I know that it's wrong. Um, and, and really, they ought to be saying, you know what, I, I don't want to do this because it's wrong. And, and I know it's wrong. I, and usually, by the way, we usually know that ourselves because our Heavenly Father. We, we know we're disappointing the Lord. And so a healthy fear of, of God is what we need. And so here we have a man who feared God, and he was right before God. You and I can be right before God. And really, what an awesome thought that that is, that you and I can be right before the Creator of all, um, of God Almighty. But Job was right before others. He was right before God. Number three... Job was right before himself. Now, I want you to notice this in verse number 1. It says here uh, that a man was perfect and upright. Job, uh, that man, was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil or stayed away from and, and, and pushed away and got away from those things that were evil. Now, when I say Job was right before you know, others, he was right before God, and then I say he was right before himself, what I mean by that is, every one of us have times in our lives and uh, uh, you know, things about us that no one else sees. There's always the you that no one else will see. There's that opportunity for you to do something that no one's ever going to know about. There's that opportunity for you to look at something or listen to something or to, to do something that no one will ever know. And are you going to do right during those times? Can you stand with a clean conscience because you know you have done right even when there wasn't an authority over you trying to make sure you do right? I um, mean, even when there wasn't someone over you watching you and saying, hey, you better do that right, you better get that, you better get that correct, but rather you say, you know what, I'm going to do the best job that I can or I'm going to do right or I'm going to live right even when no one else is watching. And this is where character comes in. This is where someone comes in and says, you know what, I want to do right before God even when no one else is around. And Job was that kind of a man. 
Job was right before others. He was right before God. He was right before himself. Um, uh, uh, eschewed evil. He was the one who had to decide, I'm going to stay away from those things that would cause me to come down those evil things. All right. He was right before his family. Number four, he was right before his family. Verse number two says, and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He had a family that was there, okay? And, and we see in these verses that he prayed for his family and he, he, he thought of his family and was right before them. Um, the closest people you should have in your life is your family. Are you right before them? Hey, this is a great lesson for dads. Are you right before your family? You can pull the wool over everybody else's eyes. It is, it is so detrimental. It is so hurting to children to have a mom or a dad that is one way in church or one way in public and something completely different at home. You know, for many years, there, was a, uh, there seemed to be a lot of families that I knew, a generation of families that I knew that knew how to walk the walk and talk the talk and act a certain way, but at home they acted some way completely different. And those kids grew up and they got out of the house and they completely went the way of the world and had nothing to do with God. Why? Because that was their example in front of them every day. Your family knows what you really are. Your family knows that you talk and act a certain way in church or with others, but yet when you get home, you act something completely different. Are you right before your family? Dad, are you right before your children? Are you right before your husband, your, your wife, uh, you know, your spouses? Um, are you right before your family? You should demonstrate... Um, uh, uh, equal love for all of your children. You remember in Genesis chapter number 25, um, uh, Isaac and, had a problem with this and that he loved uh, Esau, more than he, or, uh, Esau more than he did Jacob. And, and Rebecca, or the Rachel, one of the two, loved um, uh, you know, the one more than the other, the Bible says. And, and there was a not a, a distribute of love to all the children equally that there should have been. And we see that when we come to families, that we ought to love them like we ought to equally and love your spouse and love your family. He was right before his family. Job was right before others, before God, before himself, before his family. Um, his living right and, uh, and being right before them was the result of his Walk with God. He had a strong walk with God. Verse number five. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and, and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. When it says number of them all, he's speaking of his children. Gave prayers and a sacrifice for each one of his children. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Maybe there's something I don't know. And I'm going to do right before God myself and give a sacrifice to my children because I'm going to pray for them. All right, he, he had a strong walk with God. He, he spent time with the Lord. He had a good standing with God. We saw in verse number 8 that God himself said about him. This is when Satan and the angels came before God and, and Satan snuck in there and, and Satan talked about and the Lord said unto Satan in verse number 7, When it's come and style, then Satan answered the Lord, he said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And so Satan has been walking around the earth and, and, and observing things. And, and God said to Satan, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? And so God said, Hey, I know a guy uh, on the earth, as you've been looking around, I know a guy and, and, and that is um, upright, perfect and upright, and one that feared God and escheweth evil. Uh, and this is my God Almighty, this is my testimony of him, all right? Uh, he had good standing with God, and God recognized that Job had a good standing, you know, good standing with him. Uh, and he had a walk with the Lord, and he lived right before God. And as a result, he was right before others, right before himself, right before his family. He had that close walk with the Lord. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 18, and we'll close with this, we're running out of time. Genesis chapter number 18. You remember in Genesis 19, God destroyed God, Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness and their sin. Sin of homosexuality, by the way. We don't want to mince words about that. That is a sin before God, and God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of it. And uh, just before that, in chapter number 18, we have these three angels, and God is speaking to them, and he ends up speaking to Abraham in this passage of Scripture. And, 
and they're about to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they seem to be discussing amongst themselves whether we should let Abraham know what we're going to do. And so um, uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 18, verse number um, 16, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So they're sort of heading out now. They're going to be leaving, and they're looking toward Sodom, and Abraham sort of walking with them, and, and uh, Abram is Abraham. Uh, verse number 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham this thing which I do? So God said, God is with there with these angels, and he said to him, Shall, I, shall we hide from them? What he's going to do, seeing that Abraham, verse 18, seeing that Abraham surely becometh a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Then look what he says about him. He's going to go ahead and tell him what they're going to do, and then, of course, this amazing prayer of intercession that he will give to try to spare the city uh, before his nephew's lot's sake. But verse number 19, the Lord says about him, For I know him, that he will command, uh, command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. What an amazing statement. Could God say that about us, like he said about Job, a man that was upright, okay, uh, and perfect and upright and eschewed evil and feared God? Could God say this about us? I know him. And he will essentially raise his family right, keep his family loving the Lord. Um, what an awesome responsibility dads have. What an awesome responsibility to all of us on how we're standing before the Lord. Are we right before others? Are we right before ourselves? Are we right before uh, you know, our families? Are we right before God that God can say these things about us? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have given to us. And what a wonderful testimony in your word of a man that that prayed for his family, that loved his family, and, and sought out um, you on behalf of his family. What a testimony of Job. And Lord, may all of us find ourselves maturing, growing in you, doing our, being right before others, Lord. And, and uh, uh, may we find ourselves right with our families and loving our families. And may we find ourselves right before ourselves, Lord, as we consider the fact that we... Um, we'll be tempted and we'll oftentimes find ourselves in situations where we are, have an opportunity to do wrong. And Lord, may we find ourselves right before you that all these other things will fall into place. That can be said of us, Lord, that you know us and that we'll do right. With our head bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to give an invitation of God spoken to your heart this morning and you need to make a decision. This altar is going to be open for you. Maybe there's some dads in this room that say, I want to do right before my family, raise my family right and I need to make a decision to do that. Some things I maybe need to give up. Things I need to set aside in my life because I can spend more time doing right by my family. Maybe there's someone under the sound of my voice and, and, uh, and you just need to be right with God. You say, I just let things come into my life that have come between me and the Lord and I, I can't have that there anymore. I need to be right before the Lord. There's an opportunity for you to come to this old-fashioned altar and talk to God about that and give it over to the Lord. Maybe there's someone here that's not saved. You're not born again. You don't know for sure you go to heaven when you die. Today, day, today is the day to get that settled. Whatever the case may be, we're going to give an invitation as we do. You come forward and make a decision for the Lord. Let's all stand together as we stand. The piano beginning to play.